India, as you know, has a very long maritime history going back to the Bronze Age. Whether the Vedic literature or <clears throat> from archaeological finds, we know that the Bronze Age uh, was full of maritime activity. You had ports like Dhulavira in Gujarat, and they were sailing out both along the Indian coast, southward the Konkan coast, as well as westward out to the Persian Gulf area. So this is five, six thousand years ago. And this tradition of sailing continued into later times. So by the Iron Age, you have ships on both coasts, but particularly on the east coast from what is now West Bengal and Odisha, sailing down south all the way to Sri Lanka on one side along the coast, and on the other side sailing out towards Southeast Asia. They would sail out to the Isthmus of Kra, which is the bit of Thailand from which Mal Mal the Malay Peninsula hangs off. And then they would go across to the other side and then sail on to the Mekong Delta, in, which is now Vietnam and Cambodia, and then further on to China and Korea and so on. People don't realize this, but Korean history actually begins by the marriage of a Korean prince to a princess from Ayodhya. So these, this kind of uh, voyages were already happening um, you know, from the Bronze Age into the Iron Age. Now, by the first century BC, the uh, Indians realized that you could use the monsoon winds to do two things. One is to go across and come back because the monsoon winds and the currents associated with it, and I will talk about the currents as well. The combination of the two are very interesting because they flow in one direction for part of the year and flow in the exact opposite direction for the rest of the year. So what this allows you to do is to go somewhere and come back. So using the monsoons and the associated currents, the Indian mar mariners began to sail across both to uh, the um, Red Sea uh, all the way up and then um, trade with both the Egyptian side, the and the Greeks and the Romans, and basically with the Mediterranean world at large. Uh, they would go across to the Persian Gulf and trade with the Persians and uh, the Mesopotamian empires. And on the other side, they would sail out. By this time, as I said, they were able to cross the oceans directly, so they would sail out to what is now Indonesia and Malaysia and Singapore. And from there, further on out towards Japan and China and so on. And of course, <clears throat> they were not just trading, uh, they were also spreading Indian ideas like Hinduism and Buddhism, they were spreading Indian culture, there was large migration, both ways by the way, there were also people from Southeast Asia and, and from Arabia and so on coming to India, and there were occasional naval uh, operations as well, and most famously by the Cholas. There was also, incidentally, a lot of boat building for internal riverways. So whether the Indus or the Gangetic system, uh, many, there was a significant amount of uh, uh, in, inland uh, waterways being also sailed. Now what is interesting of course about all of this is that the Indians used a peculiar boat building technology for building ships both for oceanic voyages as well as for internal uh, um, travel which involved essentially stitching together the ship. So this is very different from what you would think you would do, which is to nail a ship together on a frame. Instead, they stitched the planks together using a peculiar technique. Now remember, this is not because of the lack of rust-free nails. Indians were very highly advanced in metallurgy, and as you know from the Meroli uh, iron pillar, they actually knew how to make rust-free nails. So it wasn't because we didn't know how to make rust-free nails that we were stitching it together. And it's a bit of a mystery, which we hope to solve as, uh, through this project, about exactly why they preferred to continue to use this uh, stitched technique for uh, putting a ship together. Now I've got two images on the screen. Uh, they are both of uh, uh, river uh, boats, but the reason I have used them here is because in both cases you can see uh, that the uh, planking is very clear. Several ancient ships mention the maritime activity. So, so your know, maritime activity is even mentioned in the Vedas, going back 4,000 years uh, or, or, or 
six thousand years. Who knows when when the put together? But even in later texts, you hear a lot about maritime activity, and specifically, you have mention of boat building. And one of the texts which does that is the Yukti Kalpaturu, which was put together or written personally by Raja Bhoj about the 10th, 11th century. Now, this um, document mentions uh, a lot of classifications of different kinds of ships that were being built. And he also mentions that these ships should be preferably stitched together. So it's not like Indians didn't know about nail ships. They were obviously dealing with other cultures that were building nail ships. And they were also building some themselves. But the Yukti Kalpataru clearly mentions that the preference should be given to uh, building ships by stitching them together. It also gives classifications of Samanya ships, which were uh, ordinary ships, which were probably the bulk of the ship built ships. And these ships were somewhat broader than the others. So these were used for both maritime activity and for river. And the ratio, there was a peculiar ratio that they used that the length was four times the breadth. And then there were various classifications how big they were. So some were much bigger than the others. But the ratio was always one is to four. And then there were vishesha ships or special specialized ships which had a ratio of one is to eight. So they were quite long narrow ships which would obviously make them capable of much faster um, uh, travel. But of course, we can discuss the stability characteristics of this. Maybe they used outriggers, we don't know. But they were obviously for specialist uh, operations. And most of these Vishesha ships were for ocean going activities. We also know that they had different kinds of cabin structures internally. So the internal structure was also diff different. So we know, for example, that there were ships which had cabins extending the entire length. Then you had the Madhya Mandira, which had cabins extending in, uh, which only in the middle, and the Agra Mandira, which were the cabins only, which were forward. So according to the cabin structure also, there was classification. And then again, for the Vishesha ships, there were uh, 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 classifications by size. I'm just, I just have the Vishesha ones here, just so that you know. And these lengths are in cubits. Cubits are, I think, about 0.45 centimeters, so a little less than a, 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 a meter. But you can see that these ships are not small ships. The very biggest ship, uh, as you can see, uh, the Begini, uh, would be uh, 176 cubit, which is like, uh, you know, uh, not a trivial uh, size, uh, almost 80 meters size. And then, as I said, there is the 1 is to um, 8 ratio. So the breadth was only 10, 10 meters. So it's a very narrow, long uh, ship. Um, they, these were specialized ships. We don't know exactly. Unfortunately, the Yukti Kalpataru doesn't tell you exactly what the use of these ships were. It also tells you the height uh, of the ship, of the hull. So this is not of the, of the mast, which were much, much higher. Now, there are foreign travelers also who tell you about these uh, Indian ships. And going back to the first century Ptolemy, he says that Indian shipbuilders built a fleet of 2,000 ships. And each of them, and this is perhaps an exaggerate and perhaps not each of them, but certainly there were certain some ships which were capable of accommodating a thousand troops. Now, this is important because it suggests also naval activity. And they could bring a thousand troops, horses, and a vast quantity of supplies. So a single ship could bring a thousand troops. That's a non-trivial size ship. Even by modern standard, that's a non-trivial ship. Then there's Marco Polo by the 1300s. And he's talking about ships that were so large that they had a crew of 150 to 300 men. And it was propelled both by oars and sails and it had multiple decks. And there were over 60 cabins for merchants. So these are again, not trivial size ships. And there were cargo holds and so on. And the ship was <coughs> divided by bulkheads. Again, going back to the previous, uh, it corroborates what we heard in the previous uh, slide in the Yukti Kalpataru that there were all these cabins and bulkheads. But interestingly, he mentions that many of these ships were fastened by iron nails. So I'm mentioning this, that the iron nail technique was also alive, it, and some people preferred that. 
And then there's Niccolo Conti who comes about a hundred years later and he says that there were ships weighing about a thousand tons and had five sails. So again, I'm repeating all of this so that you understand that these are not, you know, small amateur products. These are serious ships. And then you have another half a century later, Santo Stefano, who comes and says, the timbers of the ships were stitched together with cords and sails made of cotton. So you can also hear about the stitch ship technique was still alive. Uh, just at the eve of the Europeans turning out. Do remember that much of this is not being done by, you know, individual merchants or mariners, you know, single-handedly single crossing the oceans. Much of this is being done by corporatized guilds, very similar to multinational companies. You know, they had these very colorful names as well. One of these corporatized guilds from India was called the 500, which means that they had 500... Uh, shareholders and they lasted hundreds of years they had their own navy and they would very often uh, survive over many dynasties suggesting that uh, you know the kings usually didn't mess with them because they were obviously quite powerful and other interesting thing is that these voyages were funded by temple banks so very often you may wonder why Indian temples in medieval period had so much gold uh, you may get the impression sometimes that that's because the kings were handing over their gold to the temples. That is not the case. Uh, getting Indian politicians to hand over their money to anyone was difficult even at that time. So the reason they had so much gold is that they functioned as banks. And many of these voyages were funded by the, the venture capital and the loans were given by these temples. And this is why they had such a lot of gold. 